n- never before now, I would say, is, is, it, is it a good time to have something called numbers therapy, I guess. We've got the merge happening. Um, we have everyone uh, waiting for a spike in ETH price, possibly, but knowing that the macro economy in that situation is looming in the background as well. So with that said, welcome everybody to Numbers Therapy episode 21. Uh, today's episode titled Tech Evolution, Loch Ness and FUD Monsters. Uh, first, there's a brief note from our sponsor. If you're listening on here, it means you're probably below a certain age, and it probably also means your parents or even grandparents have no idea what on earth you are into with Web3s and NFTs and tech and social media. So the Generational Bridge has got your back. Every Saturday, the award-winning newsletter goes out teaching parents and boomers and the like about lingo trends and implications of what younger people are doing. The result, your parents understand and appreciate what you're doing as well. Special access for MVHQ members. Sign up your parents now, thegenbridge.co slash MVHQ. So we are officially at episode 21 on our way to 100. First off, major thanks to the MVHQ team for helping drive this ahead. It's really been magic, you know, being able to celebrate episode 20 last week was was really great. And now we're just moving on and, um, and, and moving ahead. So it's very exciting. Um, as a result, you'll see we have more and more episodes releasing onto Spotify, Apple and other channels. So please check us out. Um, and we'll also have and, and continue to have more advanced features and production elements rolling out as well. So something else to look out for. Um couple other notes we do continue to want feedback from our crowd especially our mvhq crowd mvhq crowd in terms of what you want to hear or any other feedback so if you have any thoughts or ideas please make sure to reach out and then lastly the uh, application to be a guest on numbers therapy is out there as well and poop or myself can also guide you if you're not familiar with where it is and we may have something brewing there too in fact uh that we'll talk about at some point so For framing purposes, the purpose of Numbers Therapy, of course, is to talk through the macro and bring on and showcase our experts in here. And I guess this is as good of a time as any to to be doing that. So more specifically, the goals of Numbers Therapy are uh, number one, so everyone can understand and uh, how how all the big pieces fit together. Make better decisions with NFTs and other investments using a balanced perspective. Learn about or from some of our people in here and get different perspectives. And then also learn about different areas and opportunities that exist out there as well and different ways of thinking. So, and, you know, I always say as a reminder for anybody who's listening live, right, we have different levels in here, right? So it's extremely important that everybody's along for the full ride each episode. So again, if you have questions along the way, if it's a definitional question or an acronym, you know, we have guest questions in here. Please make sure to drop your question in. I'm sure somebody else has the exact same question as you. So don't be shy. Equally, if you have a more intermediate or advanced question, please drop that in too. And we'll try to make sure we get it answered. And then lastly, important note and disclaimer, none of what you hear in here is financial advice. It's all opinions. So without further ado, and on to today's guest and episode, our guest today, many of the live crew know quite well. Um, he's commonly providing his strategy thoughts and technical alpha, but what's so cool about him is that he's quite OG as it relates to blockchain development, I believe going on almost four and a half years now, which as we all know is quite a bit of time developing in the web three space. As a result, he's seen a lot technically, but equally interesting reacting product wise to market sentiment. And we'll talk about this a little bit later as well. Uh, he resides currently, I, I believe, in England, although he's from Scotland originally, and is quite adamant about you not visiting Loch Ness when you visit Scotland, which we may touch on as well at some point. Uh, so the good news is, is our international journey continues, and I think we'll get a, a bit more of a unique perspective today. Should make for a really fantastic conversation, and I'm very much looking forward to it and happy to call him as a friend as well. Please welcome everyone, Ezrin, to the stage. Ezrin, how are you doing today, man? Hello, hello, hello. Yeah, I'm good. I'm very good, thank you. Uh, thanks for having me on. And yeah, episode 21, this is going to be cool. No joke, man, the the, uh, the Blackjack episode. So That's it. we'll start. <laughs> exactly. So we'll start where we always do. So maybe if you want to start by telling us a little bit about your pre-NFT boom background you know, where was your attention focused? And maybe also, you know, how did you, how did you get there as well? Yeah, sure. Um, 
like like most people, um, when I was growing up, I didn't really know what I wanted to do. I just kind of bumbled through college and did this and did that um, and popped out the other end as a, a graphic designer. I, I'd flunked development in uni and um, somehow landed in a job which basically allowed me to keep pushing the boundaries a bit a bit further each time so started off as a as a designer and then a kind of front end developer and then a back end developer and then before I knew it like 10 years had gone by and I'd moved to London at the time and been working in the startup side of things there um I'd done some kind of agency work before um and yeah always been a developer basically that's very, very cool. We, we heard a parallel. I hadn't heard a parallel like that a whole lot in the past. But I think when Kayfish was on about like five or six episodes ago, he also talked about kind of like on the job, pragmatic, you know, learning and pragmatic training where he also wasn't a dev until he had to be a dev. It sounds like that's like pretty similar in your case where you came from the design side of things, had a little bit of, of, uh, of development background, but then kind of had to learn on the fly and, and get smart on the fly. Is that right? Yeah, I mean, that's the thing. I mean, there's been so many self-taught developers um, who, if if you're good enough and you put the work in, there's no need for someone to have looked at your CV and say, oh, you didn't do computer science, therefore you're not getting a job. That's It's one of those rare industries where you could just be good at something from your own time of doing it and you could quite easily pull off a decent position at a decent company just by being good at what you're doing yeah i mean look there's still this like this tremendous opportunity that exists there's just a shortage a shortage of blockchain web3 devs that exist out there and they're going to be increasingly needed and also by the way not only are they going to be increasingly needed right but the ones who are there for, for you know for a longer amount of time are going to become senior at some point too so that you know there still continues to be lots of opportunity there for anybody interested so you started developing within the Web3 space in 2018, if I'm not mistaken. Is that about right? Yeah. So while I was working in kind of Web2 startup stuff, um, I was going to a lot of Web3 meetups down in London and, you know, different Ethereum meetups and whatnot. And that's when I kind of learned a bit about the space and some of the companies that were around. Um, and I knew I wanted to try and get into work at one of those companies so i met someone who was building a project um said i would just like work for free i would um i would basically you know do some solidity development um they, they'd hired some freelance people that i could learn from so i did that just to get something to use to apply to um and then i did apply to consensus and managed to get um a job there and been there kind of ever since really yeah, thanks for sharing that i mean i think one thing that i just want to touch on there that that's maybe worth catching i didn't think we would we would touch on it today but th this this question comes up often right so for anybody who has things you know the question's always like how do i break in how do i get a role somewhere that kind of a thing outside looking in it looks, you know, it often looks glamorous and people always see like how much people are getting paid. And so as a result, they're like, you know, how come I'm not getting these jobs that are formally posted or whatever else it is. But you know, something you mentioned, Ezra, in that like, I feel like doesn't get spoken about enough, but that can't be, you know, it can't be overlooked, I would say, is the concept of going in and developing trust and building trust with someone and possibly working for free on something, right? To be able to figure out, you know, showcase what you're able to do build trust with them, you know, also feel out if it's something you like as well, right? I, I feel like it's a very good strategy that de-risks, of course, for, for the team you're going to work with, but, but from human nature naturally gets them comfortable with what you're able to do. You treat it the same way you do any other project, of course, and make sure you deliver, but then it builds trust and leads to good places a lot of times. So I'm happy. I'm really happy you said that. And um, I don't know if you have any thoughts about that, but I, I'm a big fan of that approach for whatever it's worth. Yeah, I mean, you got to open your own doors, right? So things come to nothing. Some things could be 
could be beneficial to you and just even even just that extra line on your cv it's an extra reference um and if you've worked for free for someone and you did a decent job they're gonna they're gonna sing your praises um i would also say though that a lot of the developers that do get into web3 have very little web3 knowledge that's quite a common thing as well. If you're a good developer, um, a lot of the times people consider Solidity quite simple in comparison to other languages. So if you've got the core concepts of development down, there is no reason why you couldn't apply to a Web3 company and learn about the bits that you're missing. Um, it's such a new space and no one's expecting you to have like a a massive list of web3 um like jobs or projects under your belt they they just want good developers um and if you've got an interest in web3 and you're a good developer then most of these companies have decent training um internally that they can then offer you to get you up to speed but anyone who would be listening to this or anyone in mvhq i mean you've probably got a hell of a lot more web3 experience and knowledge than some of the other people so yeah it's definitely if it's somewhere you want to be aiming then for sure go go and have a have a have a try at joining one of these business um, companies if if that's something you're keen on doing i know in like the vein of investing and trading like we often say you know we're early and I, we say that like yes it's true but like we also say it a little bit in like a funny way of course as well but genuinely speaking, if you're thinking about going into building projects or developing in Web3, like we are still just tremendously early, right? It's just going to go exponential in terms of needs that exist, which gives you not just opportunities now, but, but you know, growth opportunities to, to lead teams, all those good, good, kinds, good kinds of things. So, okay. So looking back at 2018, um, if you can jog your memory a little bit. You know, for for those who were not around then within the Web3 space, which is a large percentage of us, right? What, what was the market sentiment at that time? Do you remember back, like, what people were thinking? You know, where was blockchain in the scheme of people's minds at that point? What was that like? I mean, it was, without a doubt, the biggest buzzword ever. Like, any any startup, if they could throw the word blockchain in there, they, they would immediately get funding. Like, it was it was one of these things that people didn't really understand, but they they knew if if they had some sort of blockchain built in there, then then they could probably get enough funding for a while, um, and and that was what I saw on a lot of the kind of initial projects that I worked on. Um, from even like one of the big things with blockchain was then mentioned the word trustless, and so. One of the things we saw was loads of competing companies who do a lot of business between each other, like forming consortiums. So, for example, one of the ones that I worked on for about a year was a it was a consortium of oil traders and banks, um, and they wanted to use blockchain to basically stop having to run individual systems between each other and like FedExing documents from one head office to another head office and then someone else putting the data into their system and then someone else putting it into their system and you know like these kind of prehistoric um systems that these guys were using and so what they what they were trying to achieve was some kind of setup where i could sell oil to you in this single system no one else could see that we've done this trade and then you could then go to a bank and get that get a loan or like money up front for that trade and some insurance but i wouldn't know that you'd then gone and insured our trade or got a loan against it so it was like this kind of system basically where data could pass between each node and each node would have been a a different company and these nodes then built up this network which um allowed these people to you know they, they all saw the code they all approved the code they all hosted it um and it was this kind of trustless consortium and mechanic between all these different traders which allowed them all to basically um do all this stuff between each other 
without having to run their own systems and then we could just keep building features into that like th that these guys were used to used to doing um and and that was all great that's wild uh that's, that's a wild story to actually hear i've never heard, quite heard a story like that before but i you know you and i were also talking yesterday a bit and very related to what you're saying it sounds like there were many of these you know people building for investor purposes stories right and not so much about actual business or profit purposes they're just you know doing it for, for, from a sheer investor lens let's say do you have any stories that you you know that come to mind about that about people focusing on building products sheerly because they thought it was something that they thought investors wanted was going to help garner more investment even if it you know didn't necessarily make the whole uh, the most sense that kind of a thing um I'm trying to think I mean, there was just so many random company ideas, business ideas, like in the early days. Um, even, even, even internally, uh, there was like some quite strange little departments that that were popping up here, there, and everywhere, doing doing very odd projects. Like you know, name anything on the blockchain. And it was just like, come on, that's that's not that's not going to work. <laughs> and um. And we used to we used to fight back to some people who would who would come and ask to for us to build stuff because you'd have to say to them why why are you why would you want a blockchain for that like there's no need for a blockchain there um, and you know they were happy to run like one node and it was just like so pointless um, and and it was it really was just people trying to squeeze blockchain into everything. Um, and there was quite a few people that used to just like joke about it and like avoid projects because they were like, no, that's absolutely pointless. We don't want to be doing that. Um, yeah. But there was enough of it, you know, there was there was enough people um, coming and asking for different things. And yeah, there was a few success stories and consensus has quite a cool way of working. Like you, if you wanted to, to come up with that, a new product or a new business strategy, they would they would spin you out into like a, your own team, and you could basically go and take funding for a certain amount of time, and you could you could build out your product, and they were quite happy to just let all this research happen, uh, especially in the early days, like when when you couldn't you couldn't stop making money from the price of ETH. Um, so they, they really didn't mind. It was it was all very lavish how, how it was ran. And then they slowly but surely had to then, you know, make it much more grown up and um, trim off some of the things that were just really not working and start focusing a bit more on, on their main products. Yeah, that's interesting. Um, you know, one of the other... You know, the other one of the other vantage points that, of course, exists, like we focus partly on the investor side of things. Right. And like you said, in 2018, everybody's stuffing blockchain and whatever into <laughs> into their their pitch decks or whatever, just to be able to get funding. Right. And angle their business that way. But of course, like another big constituency that exists is users. Right. And in, in, in users and customers. Like, what was that like in 2018? So, of course, there was the buzz on the investor side of things that everybody wanted to, to stuff blockchain in. But were consumers and users also kind of at that same point? And, you know, do you, do you remember back like what it was that they wanted at that point or how they were thinking about it? Um, well, that, I mean, that was one of the biggest reasons why Consensus started was because there was not enough tooling or product or like, you know, wallets or even things. I mean, if you think of the Consensus like product suite, you've got MetaMask, which gives you a kind of a route into using the blockchain and Fura is the the way that you then connect through to the blockchain and manages your kind of access there um, and then you've got like Truffle which was the kind of development suite um, which we've got as well and so a lot of these things were needed to be built out because there just wasn't anything to allow people to even start innovating on the like, on Ethereum so those are still probably the three main uh, products that they they offer, and you know there's been a bunch of competition that's that's come out since then, and consensus is trying to kind of focus a bit more on 
keeping up with that. Um, but yeah, it's nice to see competition now because then that obviously spurs innovation and allows everyone to keep pushing the space forward. But yeah, back in the day, there was there was there was nothing really. Yeah. So you, yeah, with that timeline, remembering back to 2018 when you guys were starting to develop some of these tools, right, for both consumers and then also developers. It sounds like as well, right? And then moving forward towards like 2020 when you know when COVID started that whole thing. What was that path like? Did you do you remember? Did did you see a path where there was more, you know, developer adoption and consumer adoption, and it was very noticeable from your side? And 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 equally, did you guys adjust then? You know, the, your product offerings or features or benefits as a result of some of the feedback you were getting. What was that path like for those couple of years? Yeah, so I think I mean I think that when when the amount of users started increasing, like in the millions, um. The amount of people doing like MetaMask swaps, for example, it was it was getting crazy. Like the amount of people that were on board now, the amount of new wallets that were getting generated every day, every week, every month was, and the NFTs had a massive, like they they helped a lot in that, um, because that brought just so many people who you know weren't necessarily interested in trading coins into trading pictures, <laughs> and. Um, and so, yeah, we kind of spent a lot more time focusing on some of those different areas. So, you know, Infura's started to build out like an NFT API that allows you to get floor prices and all that kind of stuff. Um, MetaMask is adapted a bit more. For example, you saw recently how we've now, um, when you go and sign up, transaction like on a wallet drainer for example you it tells you you're now offering access to all of your board eight yacht club instead of just saying like set approval for all and you don't really know what it's what it's asking so loads of those little features are, are being brought in because of the way that users are either being scammed or users need certain things or you know they're kind of pivoting and improving all those tools as much as as much as possible that makes and sense. a lot of that I, happened during the boom that we saw during COVID. Yeah, yeah, that 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 all makes a lot of sense now. And we we've seen this issue before, right? Not just limited to Web three of of team development teams putting out products that you know it it, it has like code written externally facing, right? And it's not so user friendly. So the user looks at it and they're like, "What does this even mean, right? What is this contract that I'm even signing right now? I have no idea what I'm signing." Exactly. Um, so <laughs> exactly. That's Set approval a good for idea. all. Yeah, I'll do that because I really want this peppy dick. But like, yeah, I'll, t- I'll take it. Oh no, I've lost everything. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Exactly. So, um, was, it sounds like that was the path of you putting more attention on NFTs. Was that you were developing? And as a result of developing, NFTs became the use case that that led to a bunch of wallet creation and, and adoption. Where did your increasing focus on NFTs come from? Um, yeah, so I, as much as I was, I've, I've been like a developer for a while and been in Web three for like four years. I, I didn't really do too much trading with like I, I did a bit like back in the day but I've always for the past like I don't even know maybe like 20 years been collecting like physical art been going to um, loads of art shows all over Europe and been, been in the kind of physical art space for a long time and it was one of the big reasons why I moved to London was to sort of be able to go to a lot of these shows and you know, collect different things. Like I, I was obsessed with it. Like I, I was ob- as obsessed with that as I am with NFTs. So being in Web3 and having that previous obsession about art in general, um, it used to be such a pain in the ass having to like queue up at the post office and like sell something to some guy in Canada, like a canvas or something that I'd have to then unstretch from the frame, roll it up, try and sort out like UPS postage for them, had no idea how much it was going to cost or weigh. And 
like even buying stuff from all over the world, like having to pay import tax and all that kind of stuff. Like that was such a pain in the ass, like to even trade art. So yeah. when NFTs came along and I kind of realized what they were, I was just like, wow, this is like what I was doing, but I can now do it way simpler. Um, and as well as that, I obviously loved so much of it from the from the art side. Um, I remember it's funny because I, I've got like a friend that I work with, and we tend to sort of talk about different things. And 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 he was probably one of the first ones to kind of bring it to my attention. And so we decided uh, he was like he's like the biggest spreadsheet nerd ever. And he was like he was using Nifty Gateway and being like, okay, so this thing dropped yesterday. And um, today we could have sold it for this, but we were like fake trading. You know, he was like framing it all up. Like if we'd bought that, we could have sold it for this. If we did this, we could have done that. And then one day we decided, okay, we're going to now buy something. So we like loaded up our Nifty Gateway accounts. And it was like a very, it was like a really early Mad Dog Jones piece on Nifty Gateway. It was like the first yes. NFT I ever bought. Um, and we we started doing that and then we realized oh there's more than just nifty gateway we can we can do all these other things and find all these other places and then he went down the road of being obsessed with art blocks and i was like nah art blocks doesn't look all that great but you know this guy can now laugh at me because we we built we built bots to like mil mint multiple across loads of wallets and he did that for like some pretty high end um drops that that we're all aware of. I don't want to say too much about him, but um he did very well for himself and I faded art blocks and went down the kind of degen minting like Oni and some other crap which I'm sure <laughs> went went to the dustbin. Hello of two results there. I remember the days when art block everyone was was minting art blocks and I was looking at it and I'm like I don't get it. I, I'm not an art person. I'm looking at it like, why are they, like, they're just consistently doing well? And I couldn't find the point to tip it over and, and just start minting it and trading it a bit more. But yeah, tale of two stories, definitely there. So, all right. I know I was such an idiot because I, if I just listened to him or like watched some of the things that were happening, even with one of the things he told me about, I would have probably been in a good place to get some nice, uh, some nice early art blocks, but yeah, I just didn't, I just didn't, I didn't get it, and then I faded it to him once, and then he just never mentioned it to me again. <laughs> <laughs> that's, I guess, that's a good friend for not rubbing it in at that point, if nothing else. Um, okay, so you know, thinking back and tell the truth here, okay, so you were, you were, you know, focusing a lot on developing, of course, right within Web three, been doing that for a while. You guys had already pushed in the direction of of the kind of wallets use case in addition to other things did you see this nft rising happening originally did you think that this was going to be that that something whether it was called nfts or otherwise these jpegs were going to be the use case that drove wallet adoption for for consensus is that what you you kind of forecasted was this was this something on your radar as, as being a possibility no and you can tell this by the fact that i i thought this was going to live and die within like six months max and like i i got lucky and i, I at one point i had like five board apes i think i got rid of them at like two ETH. i then bought back in and sold it again at like maybe nine ETH. <laughs> you know that that shows my short-term vision for how long i thought this was going to be and the sort of prices that i thought this would ever reach i did not expect us to see like 100 ETH this this that and the other like i didn't see it no the, the line between strategic swing trader and anxious trader, I guess, is like very, very fine sometimes. Um. <laughs> yeah, I was anxious. And, you know, I was telling people like, oh, my God, I can't believe I, you know, this happened or that happened. And, and, and then like three months later, I could have looked back and been like, damn, you know, of course. Damn, damn, <laughs> damn. <laughs> understandable that you had your your hypothesis and you went with it. So, OK, so like. Carrying into the current day, right? We've got the merge that's happening right now, but yet the macro environment is not so strong as we know. You know, what do you think is likely to happen and also be expected for projects in the near term? You know, where do you, where do you think we're going in the near term, in the midterm, 
you know, and, and you can think about it from or talk about it from the, the development side too, based on your experience, whatever you feel comfortable with. Yeah, I mean, it's difficult to see. I, I feel like we're saturated beyond belief. Like, the amount of new things that we've seen coming out that's in any way more interesting than the, than the last hundred in terms of projects. Like, we are so saturated. And at the moment, it's just short term wins you know you buy something you watch it rise you then sell it off um and i just want to see the next stage of nfts i want to see the other use cases i want to see some more innovative ways of using the technology that exists um i think we all know pretty clearly now some of the some of the things that you can do with them and what they can offer and you know even even things like for example like proof collective doing the token proof entry to events and that sort of stuff like that that's that's a good next stage to sort of see where this could go to um and i don't really have any answers to what it might all be but i certainly think at the moment is we're in a bit of a lull because the only exciting things are maybe different artists bringing different artwork that's quite nice to the space um i'm a big fan of the generative stuff now even though i was talking earlier about how i faded it um like i'm still quite interested in that um but yeah we'll talk about the artist thing in a second because i think there's at least one or two interesting experiences that it sounds like you've had there. Um, but before we get to that, what is the issue right now, in your opinion? Like, of course, like the macro situation that, if, but like, what is, what is the the limitation in terms of us getting to the next level of NFT projects currently? Is it, is it a creativity thing? Is it lack of, lack of developers and quality developers? Like, what do you think the limitation is in terms of why we're not getting to that next point more consistently or more innovation or, or both? I think the expectations are too high now. I think we've we've seen so many highs, and I, I can't remember where I saw it, but you know, someone posted this like spreadsheet from all time highs to to nows, and like so many projects that that we all all loved over the past year are like down eighty five percent from their all time highs. Everyone and everything that's launching, we're all expecting it to kind of hopefully get to either some crazy high valuation or, I don't know, or, or expect it to go nowhere. So um, that's kind of how we're trading. We're so short, we're so like short-sighted and we're so, we're, we, we don't believe that any project is really going to deliver what they say they're going to deliver. Like we're all trading such like so quickly. Um and I think we need to just break out of that mold. Um I think that probably the one that the one that I'm most interested in seeing where it goes is obviously the, the Moonbirds proof ecosystem because that's the first one that I've kind of that I actually believe there's like a long term ten year play. And I'm sure many of the other ones are, are obviously expecting to do that too but we just see and don't believe that they've that they've got the the funding to to really do it um but i think these big these big ones like proof and yuga labs and i think those ones are going to be the ones that have got the funding to push things f as far as we want to see it from the current s space um but i want to see some some something new from from the smaller guys i don't i don't know what it is but um i want to see it i don't know what it is do you think i mean you've obviously been through at least a couple cycles on the crypto side of things right you talked about initial wallet adoption and hype that, that exists that you've been through a couple of those cycles from an investor and trader standpoint do you think that nfts are you know, looking forward are going to have a similar kind of a cyclical situation, right? Where, you know, crypto, it's still BTC led, like it or not. Um, you know, and that, you know, and then alts follow on, it's still being an alt, whether we like that or not. 
Uh, and it's this four yearish kind of cycle that exists, right? And people seem to think that those cycles may narrow over and that it may not be four years anymore and, and they'll decrease in length, let's say. But do we think do you think it's it's gonna be a similar type thing for NFTs where it's multi a multi-year cycle in between which I guess there's both building as well as, you know, the consumer sentiment warming and getting more comfortable with it, let alone institutions, that, that kind of a thing? Do you think it's like a multi-year cycle also for NFTs moving forward? I mean, if if we have a cycle, like does it, that that will mean that we have new stuff, right? So it could well be. I mean, I don't, I don't really know. You, you, as I mentioned it earlier, like you you said, like oh, anxious traders versus um, what was it you said? I forget. Strategic swing traders. I think I said. Oh, <laughs> that was a little bit tongue in cheek for whatever it's worth. <laughs> yeah, 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 and. Like we we know we can tell even even in like Metaverse HQ like you can tell when the market's low how how interested everyone is by how many people sit in VC right um and so we need to start we need to start grabbing people's attention again uh, and we need to start seeing how that works like. <sighs> I've 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 thought about this quite quite a lot, and I just don't really. I don't. I mean, it's so we're so early in terms of the this whole technology, but we've just we've just absolutely hammered it. Like we have saturated the hell out of out of what we've had with very little improvement. You know, we went through the whole thing of like, oh, we can improve the minting process with like ERC seven two one A and that was fine for a while and then and then gas wasn't really that big a problem anymore. Um and so then we were quite happy to mint again. And then allow list came along to stop us having gas wars. And then L twos came around for a while and meant that we had very little transaction fees but then no one wanted an L two NFT. Um and so we, we've kind of already seen these cycles, like these trends change so much even in a year. I just want to see something bigger. Yeah. Yeah, that makes sense. I, I, I mean, I totally understand. I still think no matter what, right, like the profit motive is always a thing, right? If you're a trader, if you're an investor, if you're a builder, it doesn't matter, right? Like the premise is still the same, which is. I'm happy to do these things and I want to create impact or make money, or, but like money, I, I want to make sure that the money's there as well. Right. And that's what motivates people. So, I mean, look, yeah. it does require the, the macro cycle to be complete or at least leveled off. Right. At all the meanwhile, we're building in the background or coming up with new ideas or theories, whatever else. And that in conjunction with some of the things that you're saying, right. The new ideas coming out, the market, you know, and in, in the market rejecting the bad concepts, right? Whether that means actually rejecting it or whether, you know, minting it and flipping it and then it goes to zero, whatever. The market rejecting it in, in the midterm, let's say, and maybe that's the path there that ultimately um, ultimately exists. And it just keeps getting better over time. So, uh, related thing, Ezra, that you've talked about too is, you know, you came from the physical art side of things, right? You had all those issues. Um, that we're all, I, th I think many of us are all too familiar with in terms of physical goods and, and that kind of thing. But it sounds like something that you encountered also is that many of the artists were trying to actually migrate into NFTs, right? But, but it sounds like for a good chunk of them, they were just having issues. Like, what was your experience there? Um, you know, was the infrastructure not there? Was the knowledge not there? And what kind of issues did, did you see the artists run into, for instance? Yeah, I think it was knowledge, to be honest. Um, a lot of these people are used to, like, running their own brand. Like, if you know what I mean, you know, they're not used to relying on other people. They're certainly not used to probably dealing with developers. Um, so there was a lot of artists that I quite respected in the in the kind of physical space who would either set up, like, a, an open sea storefront shop for example and just like post their stuff there and that was just so off-putting because i just knew how bad that was from from like a trading point of view or even a collecting point of view just you know the arts there but there was no there was no vision you know it really was no vision at all um 
and I saw some other ones uh, partnering up with like Nifty Gateway, and 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 what they delivered was just just so substandard that it just had cash grab written all over it. They were just playing off their name, and and it was just sad to see. Um, and and I think it was knowledge. I, th- I don't think they knew what the people in Web3 who collected these things or spent decent money on them or, um, you know, that sort of thing, what, what they expected. Um, and and they just kind of crashed and burned. Um, and it was a shame. There's been some good ones, though. Like, I thought the I thought what Damien Hirst did um, was was really interesting that was like such a good overlap you know it was it was like a um it was it was like the most it was like the easiest thing to visualize ever you know he was like someone who's hesitant about the space said okay there's ten thousand of these things and if you want one of my original pieces you can have one of those and that's the end of your journey or if you believe in the technology you can keep the nft and see where that goes and and that was just like i thought that was just such an amazing like piece of art in itself like the concept completely simple yet made so much sense to someone as big as him in terms of like one of the highest paid living artists and and their their um and their ability to join the space like that was a really well executed piece of art in itself um and there's been some other ones that I've seen. I was quite a fan of uh, John John Crowler, who who partnered up with Fr- uh, Fwen Club. Um, you know they do a lot of the kind of physical toys and stuff like that uh, over in Japan, and and they had a good vision. Like what they what they delivered was some some well designed assets partnered up with the fact that people who owned those could then claim some of the physical. Um, pieces of work by him from the store which are always quite difficult to get hold of in the first place and so it was like your ticket into his world to be able to get access to some of the real life things that his main fan base came from and so they could then get involved in that and there was other things that they've done like little games and stuff so I'm, I'm quite, I quite like how that side of things work like uh, using it as a bit of a, a ticket into the artist's main market that that they're known for. Um, so yeah, that was a few examples. Yeah, that makes sense. It's kind of also maybe like Tom Sex too, right? Similar concept of ticket, I guess, literally in that case, into the world. But it's it's unfortunate that for some chunk of them, you know, of these artists that they just didn't have the knowledge or foundation or support to be able to to push their product out there in, in a good, you know, in the right way, like you're saying, right. So that it would meet the needs and integrate community and all those good things as well. So, you know, hopefully that's something that evolves too. So, okay. So shifting gears a little bit, um, to the geographic side of things. So I just want to paint the picture real fast as we, we love, uh, we love traveling on the show a little bit too. So paint the picture of Scotland for a little bit. So we're going to not talk as much about England today, even though that's where you are right now. I believe um, we're going to talk about Scotland a little bit more. So just a couple fun facts for framing purposes, just because I think the knowledge is, you know, for, for most folks is lower for Scotland compared to England, for instance. Uh, Scotland, at least from the data we see, we see highest per capita income in all of the UK. By the way, UK, you know, Scotland, England, Wales, Ireland, uh, Northern Ireland, Ireland. So Scotland, even higher um, per capita income, we believe compared to England. Also, cost of living uh, cost of living is lower in Scotland compared to England. Uh, median age, 42 years old. 23% of the population is under 18 years old. So for like developed countries, average, I would say, or maybe even a bit young, you know, which bodes well typically for Web3 and tech. Only 5 million people in Scotland. So if you want to contrast that versus England has over 60 million people. So only 5 million in Scotland in total. So um other facts other things that come to mind there maybe if you can paint the picture as in for anybody who hasn't been there or is not familiar or even if you have been there you know paint the picture of maybe even like pre-web three right in, in terms of technology what is scotland like like can you paint that picture for everyone 
Yeah, um, just I am actually based in Scotland. I'm, I'm just I didn't I didn't want to correct you earlier, but I'll correct you now. <laughs> but um, <laughs> perfect. Um, yeah, so I, I mean, I grew up here. I, I kind of took a lot of it for advantage. Like I took a lot of it for is that right for for advantage? I forget how to say that. Um, and um, yeah, it's it's like. I moved away for like seven years and came back and really realised how much I, would, I I I I could have made the most of this country. Like there's there's amazing tourism. There's like some beautiful islands. There's lots of hills. There's it's like it's a beautiful place. Um, there's skiing and all sorts. And you know, there's a few main hubs. Like the reason there's so little people is because most of the most of the landscape is pretty barren. Um, but yeah, there's kind of three main areas. You've kind of got the north, which is big for oil, like North Sea oil, and then you've got the east with like Edinburgh, which is a bit of a banking hub. Um, and and then Glasgow is like the next big city, which is kind of known as the party city, um, which has got really big history and music, and um, it's where like Daft Punk and Oasis were found, and all sorts like that. Um so it's it's quite a for for such a small place it's 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 got a lot going for it. Um it's also where like, you know, Dundee is a massive place for video game development. Um same with some parts of Edinburgh as well. So, you know, Scotland brought you Grand Theft Auto, um it brought you the telephone, uh, it brought you golf. Uh, and also Scotch whiskey, and um, so for such a small place, it's 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 delivered quite a lot for the world. But similarly to things like football as well, like Scotland was the home of football, you know, the the founder of football. But we we do a lot of the the groundwork, and then everyone else runs away and makes it tons better. So that's kind of our history, really. That's interesting. That's interesting. So I mean, with what you were saying, there are some tech oriented things products that were built in there in general would you call would you call Scotland like a pretty technologically advanced place would you call it moderate would you call it lower on the adoption side of things and more conservative and i'm you know i'm generalizing here in terms of the in terms of the population yeah i would say it's moderate like i always feel like we're behind certain places like you know you go to london the UK. So, you know, we give all our money to the UK government and we get back less than we put in. And so we had a debate, we had a big uh, independence debate in 2014, which um, sadly, or sorry, I'm, I'm stating my side there, um, which was like 5% or something um, away from, from going ahead. So we're still kind of living by the UK rule and taking what we can and doing what we can with it and I'm sure the Scottish government's got a lot to blame for that as well but um, yeah it's quite an interesting landscape but certainly London is where most of the money sits and you can tell that whenever you visit London to, to see how how advanced they are compared to us in, in a variety of areas Interesting Interesting, yeah so and with that in mind, let's maybe like put some texture to this, right? So, you know, you've been in the space, in, in the Web3 space startup, and then Web3 space for at least four, four and a half years, right? Probably startups even maybe a little bit before that. Um, so you've been in it for a while, right? You're, you're from this place that's moderately technologically advanced, at least adoption-wise, right? What about your friends? Are your friends into tech? Are they into Web3? Are, are you the crazy person? that that's in web3 now or has it, has it become more of the case where like your friends are now the web3 people and and that's actively who you choose as your friends what's what's the situation there 
I mean, you can't avoid being in Web3 and not making Web3 friends, right? So there's like so many people in here that, you know, I, I chat to regularly and uh, also from working where I work as well, like a lot, you get a lot of like-minded people. But in terms of like my friends that I grew up with that I see regularly, they are not in any way involved. You know, they, I've previously told them about different things that they still text me about and regret not doing that I've mentioned that, to them that they should do. Um, and some of them randomly bought some ETH, but they just text me saying, why is this not worth 10 grand yet? You you conned me, you scammer, and all this. <laughs> Mostly joking, but you know they, they're just they're just not involved. And and you know it doesn't matter how many times you tell them or or mention it, because I don't I don't. So I, I can help you with that if you want, and they just never take you up on it. So, yeah, most of them, I would say, not interested in the slightest. Would you say that's pretty indicative of the population in general in Scotland? Uh, are your are your friends pretty indicative of the population in general? Are your friends unique and they're more conservative? Like, how would you classify that? Looking beyond your friends, I think there are a lot of like. There's there are hubs like in Edinburgh, for example. There's quite a lot of a Web three community over there, um, and I, and I, and I keep hearing little little snippets here and there. Like I was talking to a guy recently who installed solar panels, and he was saying, "Oh, I did um, an install for this this these two brothers that lived in this tiny wee village," and and I was like, "All right, what was that for?" And he said, "They're mining Ethereum." Or they were mining crypto. Maybe it wasn't Ethereum because that would have been such a bad idea with like three weeks to go. But um, they were mining crypto in this tiny little village cottage, like, and and that blew my mind. So there, there obviously is a decent amount of uh, of people doing different things and interested in this space, but they're not in my <laughs> in my friends list. Like they're not. They're just not there. Yeah. That's that's super interesting. So, so, I mean, what what is that pathway there? What what does it take to get to wider adoption with your friends within Scotland in general? And I guess equally, how do you think that adoption curve is going to go compared to, let's say, other countries in the world? Do you think it's going to be, you know, uh, ahead? Do you think it's going to be average? Do you think it's going to be behind? How do you, how do you see that going? Well, I mean, if you look at like. One of the big reasons why a lot of people in here got into Web3 was through something they really enjoyed, like basketball. You know, they started buying into the Dapper Labs thing, and that then opened their eyes to what else was available. Same as, like, the NFL. A lot of the people over here aren't interested in that, but there are certain things that they are absolutely diehard obsessed with, like soccer, football in my case. But... um and those are the things that will probably, if there's a good place for these people to jump in and, and enjoy something that they're already obsessed with, then that could be a massive thing. Like, Scotland is obsessed with football. Um, and and if there was a good way for them to get involved and make money, let's face it, that's going to be the driver, then, then that's going to open their eyes up and get them intrigued about the technology and start learning a bit more about what else is on offer um just another side note i actually when I, after going to a, lot, to a lot of the web3 meetups down in london when i came back up i noticed there was one that was called like the blockchain meetup or something which was which was going to be in like one of the glasgow universities and i thought oh, i'll just go along to that and see what it was about it was the worst thing ever do you know? Do you know? Irish you know? worst thing ever. What was that like? <laughs> well, so like basically, what they did was they almost took the piss about it, and they were saying, "So this was this was before NFTs, and 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 they basically were talking about how easy it is for you to launch a coin." So this guy did a demo where he created something called the Scot Scotland Coin, and um, he spent about twenty minutes demoing this 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 way that you could basically deploy a contract and like how many do you want? Oh, I'll have a 
10 million Scott coins and then you could then buy them from them. And it was just like, come on, man. <laughs> <laughs> that's amazing that's like that's a new kind of meetup where you have like the installed crowd and they're your immediate buyers in liquidity <laughs> yeah and then, and then it, just, it was like a marketing thing where the guy was then like you know emailing everyone like oh i'm now offering you a hundred scotland coins for you know this much and and then it was like oh big discount this week uh, you can now get 200 Scott coins for this much. And I was just like, this is an absolute joke. Like, get me out of here, man. So, so I mean, I, I want to be cognizant of time. I'm going to ask, I guess, the last question that I have, but it's, I don't know how to avoid bias right now in the last question that I'm about to ask. But I, I was going to ask, what are you both most anxious about right now as it pertains to web three growth and also what are you most excited about now and i guess i guess maybe anxious you're going to say the continuation of people putting putting out scott coins and things like that but there that exists yeah i mean most anxious about i guess it's everything just i, I guess i guess i want to see nfts do well again right so we we had so much so much fun the past year when things were booming and everyone was falling in love with this, that and the other project. And we saw some amazing, we saw some amazing teams and things getting formed and different projects doing different things. And it's, it's pretty sad that so much of those teams and projects are like so down at the moment and a lot of the holders are getting tired and wanting something new to come out. So I, I'm kind of anxious to see some of these big projects struggle even more. Um, a lot that you know I, I i've made a lot of friends in and we've got you know we've got people in here as well who work for some of those projects and i guess i just want to see a lot of them continue to push the boat out and evolve and see great things coming from some of the original things and original projects that we that we loved um and most looking forward to i guess it's just innovation i just want to keep seeing innovation um, yeah. Right now, we've obviously seen the first big change, which doesn't affect us too much. I, I don't expect to see tons of tons of artists who were previously turned off by the the bad um, environmental issues finally jumping on board. I don't really see that too much. Um, but I will be really excited to see when we start upping the throughput of transactions and being able to to do a lot more for a lot less i think i think that's going to be a massive driver for people to finally start realizing other ideas that they maybe had in the back of their mind that are now able to come and be delivered because you know we've seen a lot of web3 games come out which are just so gas intensive or they're on an l2 which then makes them less appealing and though when we start seeing like a much higher throughput of transactions and much lower gas prices i think we'll start seeing a lot more um interesting things coming to coming to east yeah i mean i think that's like a perfect note to be able to end on right i mean a lot of what you said just ties together really well like we already have membership benefits that exist and that are also getting developed and you know and, and innovated up, upon going on in the background that's not changing for many of us you know, socially, like we're spending more time with Web3 projects and Web3 membership benefits and groups and things like that, right? So that's going to continue to stay, right? All the meanwhile, people are going to continue to innovate. And, you know, the economy is hopefully going to get, uh, you know, maybe a little bit worse first and then patched up and, you know, and solidified over time. Global economy, that is. All the meanwhile, more throughputs coming in, all that. So it's, it seems like a lot of the good foundations there is the moral of the story. And, you, uh, with your discussion today, man, you, you helped put those pieces together, I think, especially with your, you know, your, your unique technical background, too. So, you know, I really, really appreciate the conversation today. It was really, really excellent. Definitely a different vantage point than, than we've gotten in our other episodes. So really appreciate it from your side. For anybody who's listening live as well, thank you so much, as always. Really appreciate everybody um, you know, who's on and supports. Again, if you have any new ideas or thoughts or anything you want us to cover, please make sure to share that. And other than that, we will see everybody next week on, on Thursday, and we'll see everybody down in VC1. So thank you so much, everyone. Yeah, thanks for having me. Appreciate it.
Thank you both. That was awesome. Esrin, I know you've